about malignancy in idiopathic inflammatory myositis screening and management. Dr. Jehani, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk today about uh, myositis related cancer. And actually, uh, just have to move this one. How to move slides. Sorry. And uh, this situation is well known and it was extensively uh, discussed in, in literature. And actually, this situation, based on the presence of epidemiologic evidence from large population. And more important than that, the presence of temporal relationship between the cancer and the mycitis, as well as the improvement of mycitis after treatment of, this, of the cancer and relapse of mycitis after relapsing of the cancer. The first time this relationship or association was described through a case report in 1916. And the first time it was confirmed through a case control was in 1985. And after that, we have a many population-based cohort study that confirming the association between the mycitis and the cancer and estimate the incidence of cancer-associated mycitis. And that's why we have many incidence rate from many studies over this schedule, or over this table, sorry. But anyway, in 2017, a meta-analysis that includes all of the previous study, or most of the previous study, uh, to estimate the incidence of mycitis and show this as a result we have here. Uh, you can see the relative risk was 4.7 in dermatomycites and 1.8 in polymycites. In regard to type of malignancy, general rule, all types of malignancy can be seen as a cancer associated with mycites, but the solid cancer is more common than hematological mycitis. And when it comes to ethnicity, the adenocarcinoma of the ovary, lung, and GI tract is more common in Western countries, while lung and nasopharyngeal cancer are more common in Asian population. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data to figure out to estimate or estimate the incidence or the type of tumor in our area. The other question is, what is the risk period of the malignancy? And most of the study, studies showed that if the patient is going to develop cancer-associated mycitis, then this will be within two years before diagnosis of mycitis or three years after. And this risk will extend up to five years from diagnosis of mycitis, but not in a case of mycitis. And more important than this, the incidence rate will be higher in the first year after diagnosis of mycitis. Actually, it reached up to 60 or 70% of reported cases. I'll move now on to more important point, which is the predicting factors. And through predicting factors, we can categorize the patient as if he has a high or average risk factor to develop cancer. And this can be divided to clinical manifestation, antibodies profile, or presence of certain clinical surgical syndrome like necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. I will start with this meta-analysis. And I will not go through all of this, but actually what happened, we have here two researchers who independently reviewed titles and abstracts of 5,829 papers. And after that, they ended with 101 papers that have potential to, be, to go through the analysis. And after reviewing of those papers, just 28 were fit to go through the meta-analysis or final analysis. And as a result, they divided the variables to predicting factors, factors treated with reduced risk of malignancy, and finally, factors showed, showed inconsistent results. So I will start with the first one, with predicting factors. 
We start with a male gender which carry 1.5 to 2 times increase in risk of malignancy. Age of 45 or older, the development of necrotic lesion in the context of dermatomyositis, and this is actually an important predicting factor, although it's a rare one. Non-necrotic leukocytoclastic vasculitis, and finally, high CD active protein. By contrast, presence of interstitial lung disease, arthritis, arthralgia, renoid phenomena, anti-extractable nuclear antigen antibodies, but not isolated ANA, because we know 50% 50 50 of malignancy will have isolated ANA, as well as anti jo one antibodies. Finally, factors that showed inconsistent results are dysphagia and ESR. Both of them were a significant predictive factor in studies that evaluating both of dermatomyositis and polymyositis, but not in the study that looking just for dermatomyositis. And maybe that's because we have a smaller size of sample in studies that evaluating dermatomyositis. I'll move now to antibody profile, and this is actually more important because it has a potential to guide our screening. I will start with anti-P155 or anti-TIF1 gamma. And from this first blood, which contain or include eight studies, in which most of the studies showed a significant association between anti-P155 and malignancy. With diagnostic ulcer ratio that reached to 27, which mean a patient with a positive anti-P155 carry 20, 27 times higher risk to develop malignancy as compared to, anti -B, uh, to negative anti-B155. One more study that's supporting this observation. This is a cross-sectional British study in which we have 282 patients, including polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and overlap. So in this study, all the patients received, um, all the patient was tested for anti p 155 140 as well as mycitis associated antibody or mycitis specific antibodies. Out of 282, we have just 16 patients who have cancer associated mycites. I'm sure you would not be surprised to know that positive anti 155 140 or a negative mycitis associated antibody is associated with cancer. Everybody knows this. But to make this, to make, make this point statistically more powerful and important to use in our practice, I'll focus on the last slide, or the last, sorry, the last line. So if you have a patient with negative antibody, or if you have a patient with a negative mycitis associated antibody with positive B155, 140, then this patient has a negative predictive value of 99 and sensitivity of 94, which in opposite way mean that if you have a patient with a negative NT155, 140, and positive uh, mycitis-rated antibody or mycitis-specific antibody, this patient will carry just 1% chance to have cancer. And this risk will reduce up to zero in a case of dermatomycites. Other antibodies that are associated with malignancy include anti-NXP2 and anti-SAE1. What about necrotizing autoimmune myopathy? You know, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy is histologically characterized by presence of necrotic muscle fibers with absent or minimal inflammatory cell infiltration. It can be associated with statin use or cancer, and serologically it could be seronegative, or it can accompany it by, or it can be associated with the presence of anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR. In one of a large cohort that include 115 patients, and in this study the aim was to estimate the incidence of malignancy and evaluate the association, association between antibodies and malignancy. So we can see over the first plot here uh, that the, the patient with seronegative necrotizing autoimmune myopathy has a higher risk to develop 
malignancy, followed by a patient with positive HMG CR, but not in a patient with anti SRP. So the authors concluding, concluded that cancer screening is necessary in seronegative necrotizing, autoimmune, myopathy, and in HMG CR positive patients, but not in anti SRP positive patients. Now we reach to the aim of our presentation, which is the screening of or screening for malignancy. And till now, we didn't have an, any official guideline or um, uh, we don't have accepted recommendation. We have many questions with possible answers. So question like, should, which, which way we have to screen the patient? Should we do routine or blind or extensive uh, way of screening? For how long sh should we do that? And what is the rule of using, what is the rule of antibodies? What is the rule of tumor markers? So we'll start with the first question. Should we do routine screening or blind screening? So routine screening means I have to do the usual thing. I have to do routine, I have to do the proper history, proper physical examination, and ask for CBC, urine analysis, ESR, CRB, store for occult blood, chest x-ray. If there is anything abnormal, I have to go further to investigate or figure out if there is any malignancy. While blind or extensive way mean I have to do the same thing as routine way, plus I have to start with a band CT scan, mammogram, and gynecological ultrasound. Routine way was supported by few studies, most of them published in the 80s, and this is one of them, where 67 malignancy in 15 seven dermatomyositis patients were discovered. According to the authors, suspicion of presence of tumor was raised in 40 patients just by good history. And in 14 cases by physical examination, 12 by good observation of routine workup. And just one case was discovered through autopsy. So according to the author, or he concluded that in the blind malignancy search was not of value in any of his cases. But actually, this was not the case through a recent cohort. We have two cohorts. One of them is this one that was published in 2018. And this one was supporting blind way of screening. So in this one, we have 48 patients with 53 cancers. 24 of them were diagnosed before dermatomyositis, and 29 cancers represent an undiagnosed malignancy at the time of dermatomyositis diagnosis. So 17 out of 29 patients, they were asymptomatic. So there is no trigger symptoms, there is no trigger sign, and their routine workup were normal. And the CT scan were the most common studies to reveal cancer followed by mammogram. And this clearly support the need for a such blind screening. The next question is how to do screening. So for sure we'll do the proper history, physical examination, and every woman should have pelvic examination with pap smear. We have to do a routine workup, including CBC, ESR, CRB, urine analysis, total full ocular blood, and women should be screened for gynecological ultrasound, looking for a small ovary, ovarian cancer that can't be detected by a pelvic CT scan, as well as mammogram. CT chest of CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. Screening should be repeated every year for three to five years. But should we do this annually for every patient? This is a real case of mine, 34 year old patient, female patient, diagnosed recently as a case of polymyositis. It was treated with interstitial lung disease, neuronal phenomena, and positive antigen one. So this is antitense syndrome. All of other myositis treated antibody were negative. Her initial screening for malignancy also were negative. She started on high dose of steroid and improved dramatically. So you can see this. We don't have any predicting factor in this lady. She's, she's a lady. She's young. We have interstitial lung disease, renote phenomena, positive antigen 1, and she responded well to steroid. So should I do this every year? The fact that we don't have a guideline means I can't say we shouldn't do annual screening. But in the same time, 
what, at the same time, we have raised question about what is the benefit of annual screening in such patients who doesn't have any predicting factor. And for that reason, some researchers start, researchers start to find out other strategy in which they can use a predicting factor like antibodies. So this was the first one, which was published in 2009, and it was based on the presence of, or our absence of mycisolated antibody as well as NTP155140. Another strategy, this one was published in 2018. It, it's, it's more comprehensive. And actually this one, um, start with the diagnosis of dermatomycitis or polymycitis or necrotizing autoimmune mycites. So once you made the diagnosis, you have to ask if there is any trigger, trigger sign or target sign or, or symptom. So if there is anything, so you have to, to screen for a cancer according to your clinical suspicion. If there is nothing, you have to go for blind screening. So you have to do blind screening in all patients initially, regardless to the predicting factor or triggering factor or triggering symptom. After initial blind screening, if there is nothing, then you have to move for the next step, which is you have, which is ask for antibodies. So in the case of polymyositis and dermatomyositis, if you have a positive TIF1 gamma or positive anti-NXP2 or anti-SAE or a negative other mycitis-shaded antibody, then you have to do annual screening. In the opposite way, if you have a negative anti-TIFN or NXP2 or SAE or positive mycitis-shaded antibody, then you have to do screening just according to the risk and the age. If you have an recruitizing autoimmune antibody and you have a positive anti-SRB, then the screening should be just according to the age and the risk factor, while if you have anti-HMG R positive, CR positive, or seronegative autoimmune necrotizing myopathy, then you have to do screening every year. What about the tumor markers? And actual tumor markers uh, is somewhat controversial because it will generate a lot of, of confusion because of lack of specificity and accuracy. So it could be positive in non-cancer condition or in benign tumor. It can be negative in early stages. It depends on uh, many things like smoking, age, size of tumor, sometimes physiological process like pregnancy. So the bottom line, usually we're not using such tumor markers in screening except for prostatic specific antigen. What about tumor markers in inflammatory, in inflammatory myopathy? This is one <clears throat> uh, of a retrospective study that includes 151 patients. And out of 151, we have just 15 patients uh, with cancer-shaded mycitis. So in this study, there was estimation of a situation between, if there's an estimation between the tumor markers and the cancer. So on the column on the right side, you can see a patient without cancer. And on the left side, you can see a patient with cancer. And on the right side, with the patient who has no tumor, still we can see high level of tumor markers, even we don't have any malignancy. So in conclusion, there was no significant association of raised tumor markers with occurrence of malignancy. And what's more than that, C15-3 level was significantly high in a patient with dermatomycitis, polymycitis, who was treated with interstitial lung disease. Finally, in regard to management, most mycitis clinical trial exclude patients with cancer, which limit our spectrum of therapeutic knowledge. In a way, treatment of tumor must, uh, most of the time leads to remission of mycitis, and even the and muscle enzyme showed significant reduction within a month after section of, of, of malignancy or tumor. However, the course of inflammatory mycitis not, does not always correspond to the course of cancer, and in some cases, or some patients, we need some long-term immunosuppression. In conclusion, incidence of cancer-associated mycitis is higher in dermato dermatomycitis with a relative risk of 4.7 and 1.8 in polymycitis. Incidence is higher in the first year after diagnosis. There's no enough data 
about the type of the cancer or incidence in our area, predicting factors is important to determine the risk of malignancy and has the potential to guide the screening. Screening should be planned or extensive and should continue for three to five years. Tumor markers lack specificity and accuracy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Jehani, for this informative lecture. And we can receive one or two questions before we proceed to the next uh, talk. Yes, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Vassan, for this excellent and elegant presentation. Now, I think one of the limitations is the uh, uh, lack of having these um, uh, antibodies in our uh, centers. So in our center, we have the JO1, non-JO1, uh, uh, has to deal with the RNA antibodies, so we don't have the NXP2 and uh, the other ones. So it would be difficult to really uh, certify these patients. The other point, um, maybe one of the uh, factors that um, might differ our patients, maybe you can look it up or colleagues can co collaborate on this matter, is maybe the um, younger age uh, population in Saudi Arabia, and we see a younger myositis patient than the described literature which might decrease the, uh, the incidence of found uh, malignancies. So uh, for the first uh, point uh, regarding the antibodies, actually we have it in our hospital. Actually we don't have it, but we can send it. So most of them um, usually send it and within one or two weeks we can get uh, the result. And I think maybe in King Faisal, we, they have the same thing. They have a full panel of, uh, it's called just my site stated antibodies panel. Include, include, it will include everything. Uh, regarding the second question, you're right. Uh, most of the cancer-shaded myositis, which was reported in, in case series or case reports from Middle East, uh, was, uh, was associated with young patients. So even with, with this, uh, still there is a cancer even in the, in the young uh, patients. But we can't conclude, or we can't come out with a conclusion because the size of population, this in, in population in, in those studies just, and, and uh, we don't have uh, a well-designed study to figure out all of this. 